Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast. We have an amazing show for you today. It's Dr. Nicole Hartnett, the Senior Marketing Scientist from the Ehrenberg Bass Institute. We're talking about the laws of marketing, loyalty, what happens when brands stop advertising, and effective creative. I'm sure you're going to love this show. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast, a place for business leaders to get the best and most credible information on marketing, strategy, and innovation. Your hosts, Mark Binkley and Vasily Sturos, share their experiences as they gather insights from the world's leading experts. Now, on with the show. Welcome to the show today. We have Dr. Nicole Hartnett. Uh, I am like bubbling with excitement to talk to you. So thank you so much for joining us. This is going to be great. Uh, for people listening, um, Nicole is a senior marketing scientist at the Ehrenberg Bass Institute for Marketing Science, which is the world's premier marketing research organization, um, looking at buyer behavior, marketing effectiveness, and has published a whole bunch of amazing pieces of, um, evidence from books, including the How Brands Grow 1 and 2, Distinctive Assets, I'm sure there's a bunch of other ones. I know there's the marketing textbook, which super nerd of me, I did get and just read for fun, <laughs> which is great. Um, and then the, uh, so in specifically, Nicole, your role is looking at um, generating new evidence-based marketing uh, and knowledge to help share with the sponsors and the marketing community in general. And some of the areas that you look at are advertising creativity and effectiveness measurement brand health, and distinctive asset measurement. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, um, Mark and Vasily. It's, it's wonderful to be chatting today. Oh, that's great. Awesome. There's honestly like so much material that, that you've been involved in and helped publish. And we're going to try and distill this into some big tangible chunks. Um, some of the laws of marketing I wanted to get into, uh, talking about loyalty and brand health and, and some of the myths around that. Um, I really would hope that we can start with just some fundamentals because when we talk about marketing, we talk about brand, V and I did an episode about branding and we're like, what is brand? And that was the only question we started to try and answer. And so there's all these different versions of the truth out there. And, and I know you guys have done so much work on this. Um, you know, in, in terms of, um, some of the core principles, can we just start with what is a, cause you guys have this really great definition about a repertoire market and a subscription market, and th they sort of separate the, the world into those two categories or you guys do, can you describe them? Mm, absolutely. And, and, and also just to your point in terms of, um, going back to, to core principles, I, I do think there's a real danger in, in assuming that everybody knows what we're talking about a lot yeah. of the time or, or, or understands it accurately. And I, I don't mean that in an arrogant sense. You know, sometimes the way we communicate, the it, it is misconstrued. So one mm -hmm. of the misconceptions are that Ehrenberg Bass says there is no loyalty. And yeah. we don't say that. We, we, we say ev loyalty is everywhere. Mm -hmm. but it's not the most important thing to be focused on. So, so I, I think going back to these, these principles is, is really important or going back to the, the laws and then and building from there and not assuming knowledge. Um, but in, in terms of what the difference is between a repertoire market versus a subscription market, it is in, in the loyalty levels. So a repertoire market is when in a category or an industry or a country, um, when most buyers in that market buy from multiple brands to satisfy their category needs um, in some sort of fixed time frame. So whether that's 12 months or six months or two years, whatever it is. Um, and so the purchases that they're making are typically sort of discrete independent events uh, and they can seemingly happen at really random times to the outside observer um, but 
across those buying occasions, people will tend to buy from a subset of brands that is available to them. So they form a repertoire and and we consider those people polygamously loyal and that's the norm, whereas soul loyalty is, is rather rare. Now, mm-hmm. subscription markets are when most buyers buy from one brand at a time. So you allocate most of your category requirements entirely to one brand and then you switch between brands over time. And and these situations, they tend to be where the purchase mechanism is through a subscription or a contract, and hence the name subscription. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you only have one car insurer at a time. You only have one mobile service provider um, at a time. And so consequently in those markets, sole loyalty is much more common than in repertoire markets. And so, so that's a key difference. But I, I do want to point out that not all markets that are bought based on subscription or contract are subscription markets. They are can be, in fact, repertoire mm-hmm. markets. So um, if you think about in a, in a B2C context, uh, streaming services, mm-hmm. um, you know, video content, you can subscribe to multiple at one time. Um, in a B2B context, uh, in, say, business intelligence and analytics software, a company can have multiple subscriptions to multiple brands. So whether that's mm-hmm. Tableau or um, SPSS or Microsoft Azure or um, Salesforce, you know, you can have multiple at the same time. So they're a subscription buying process, but they are a repertoire market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Netflix one, I was thinking about that. That's a good one because I, I actually have yeah. a sports subscription. I got to remind me, I just got to cancel that because I still haven't done that. <laughs> but yeah, like I have a sports one. I've got Netflix. I've got Disney and then whatever else we have. Um, yeah, and because in that case, Mari, it's you're being polygamous, then that would fall under the category of repertoire because you have multiple streaming services, I suppose. Is that right, Nicole? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And then, the and that's the ones of, you pay for, let alone the ones where you borrow passwords where you're not meant right. to. <laughs> we're not we're not saying that in this podcast, but yes, <laughs> no, that never happens. Never, never yeah. happens. <laughs> um, and then the typical repertoire market, like I, I always think about, you know, almost everything I buy at a grocery store, let's say, or or clothing or retail, mm-hmm. like that kind of thing, would be your typical repertoire markets for the most part. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, in in my experience. Many more markets than you would expect are repertoire markets. Um, you know, we've, we've been doing a lot more work in the B2B space, um, the Ehrenberg Bass Institute broadly mm-hmm. with, um, and, 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 you know, a, a chunk of that is with the LinkedIn B2B Institute. Um, and even markets that we anticipated would be subscription in mm-hmm. terms of high loyalty or not. Um, and that's really interesting. Um, it, it shows that people or companies, the, the decision makers in companies, uh, diversify. Um, you know, part of that may be a risk assessment thing, um, but, you know, y- you do work with multiple vendors in mm-hmm. some cases where, you know, we would anticipate, no, that that company would have all of their equity management, mm-hmm. you know, exchange or whatever it is with a single bank, but no, they, they have it with several um, mm-hmm. You know, and and, and that's, and then if it is a repertoire market and that is normal behavior, then it kind of changes the mindset in how you, you approach the task of of growing your brand. So let's talk about that and V we'll trade off here, but um, let me just take the first shot on this because you talked about the, one of the main differences in loyalty. So from mm-hmm. a, the difference between a repertoire and a subscription market, I think you mentioned that repertoire markets are typically less loyal, those customers, and re- subscription markets are more loyal. Um, but can you talk about, I mean, there's, we were just talking beforehand, like so many marketing textbooks, they're all about the goal is to create and keep loyal customers. And that's how you grow. Mm-hmm. And, and so much of um, the Ehrenberg Bass's work kind of flips that statement on its head and it starts with think with this idea about loyalty. So do you mind just kind of talking about that uh, a little bit? Yeah. Um, so the, the thing is, is loyalty differs between markets. Um, 
you know, some categories, subscription categories have very high levels of loyalty and, and that's sole loyalty. So if you're looking at a subscription category, you know, a, a, a normal level of soil, soul, soul loyalty for um, a brand could be somewhere between 80 to 90%. Mm-hmm. Whereas in a, in a, in a more classic repertoire, you know, you might find in terms of share of wallet or share of category requirements, you might, you know, achieve 30 or 40% of, of what people are spending or the purchases they're making. Um, and the soul, the, the number of sole loyals in that market are maybe anywhere between one and 5% of any brand's customers are solely loyal. Wow. Uh, and that's part of a, a function of purchase frequency. So how often the category is bought, but it's also time. All of these metrics are time bound. So how long you watch someone or watch a group of people um, inevitably adjusts those loyalty metrics, mm-hmm. right? Um, but the thing is, is that when you, when you confine to your category, the level of loyalty between brands differs only slightly. So the the law of double jeopardy, um, which is probably what we're best known for and is the one that speaks most directly to loyalty, is that when we look at brands in a category differing in market shares, uh, the biggest difference between big and small brands is in how many customers they have Uh, and much less so in how loyal those customer bases are. So it's typically framed in the negative uh, where small brands suffer twice. They have fewer customers that are slightly less loyal. Um, and, And so taking that on board, what that means is that as a brand to grow, the biggest challenge you have in front of you and the most productive one is looking to increase your penetration because that's the big difference, right, uh, versus trying to increase loyalty. And, and the fact that, you know, the brands that are much bigger than you only have slightly more loyalty, if you have an objective to go, oh, well, we're going to have 100% solely loyal customers or we're going to make every, every single customer buy one or two times more in this time period, it's actually highly unrealistic because not even the biggest brands in the category have achieved that. So mm-hmm. if anything, what that law does is it creates boundaries and helps you set realistic and productive objectives. Hmm. And, and the fact that these, lo- that these levers are independent, like I can choose to pull the penetration lever or I can choose to pull the loyalty lever and they're completely uh, separate to one another. They're not. They're highly correlated. But the big story is that Big brands sell to millions more households or millions more companies, or probably not mm-hmm. millions, hundreds of more companies, um, and they sell slightly more, or at a high, or, or they sell. Uh, when you when you go into B two B, it's not necessarily it's often a service based, so it's a number of subscriptions or mm-hmm. like as a number of employees yeah. or or the mm-hmm. the scope of products that they use and things like that. Mm-hmm. That's super interesting because, you know, when Mark and I, like I said, we're, we're, we're going through this uh, process right now doing our EMBA and, and whatnot. And we did a marketing class and loyalty is front and center, which is, you know, what you would expect. Like there's going to be a lot of context around it, but it's always one sided and the importance around, you know, uh, building that loyalty, building that, that, that affinity and whatnot. I worked in the airline industry and a way you valued an airline is how many were part of their loyalty database, right? And it's mm. it's so top of mind, if you will, for more, so many organizations. Why do you believe organizations still lean heavily on that pillar without understanding the context of even the two characteristics that you mentioned, like repertoire and subscription, that could be skewing those results um, for your organization service and, and whatnot? No, it's. I, I can only speculate on this. I, I don't know why people are, are so fixated on loyalty. Um, I guess you know uh, part of it is you know all those old textbooks, those those nineteen sixties foundational ones that talk mm-hmm. about loyalty, segmentation, targeting, all that. Um, it, it kind of came from a mindset of they were they were borrowing or shoehorning theories from sociology and psychology research. So they were taking theories and observations from 
people's interpersonal relationships or, or what motivates them in their lives more generally and applying mm-hmm. that to brands. You know, I want really good friendships. Well, now I need to want really strong ties and associations with brands. And and the key difference, I suppose, um, and, and this comes up fairly frequently, but I think it's referred to fairly flippantly, is that we know that in the context of, of making brand and buying decisions, um, they're often done with very little thought and consideration. They're done in very short time periods. And in the interactions that people have with our brands, they're often fleeting and separated by large periods of time. So uh-huh. you, you've got a situation that is not a friendship. Um, <laughs> and and, yeah. and so therefore we, we just sort of, you know, you may not even know that like these kind of ingrained ideas, they can still keep affecting how you think even. And, and so you need to actively try to counter program. No, penetration is really important. And a light buyer still has value mm-hmm. and they represent the bulk of my customer base. Um, mm-hmm. you that's, know, a, so, that's a super fascinating one too, because the, yeah. I mean, going down the end, this is another thing I wanted to ask you about heavy and light buyers. Cause to V's point, those people that are on the airline loyalty program or everybody's loyalty program are the heavy buyers. And you think I'm moving mm. the needle because we're getting more of them. I'm going to build yeah. out segments of people that are like this. I'm going to retarget ads to people who are like my heavy buyers and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Almost completely dismissing the light buyers. But why are light buyers important? Mm. Um, you know, and it's funny you talk about airline because I am... Um, our local airline Qantas, you know, I have, I'm part of the loyalty program and I'm about to lose my, my status. And I feel really terrible about that. Um, <laughs> cause I don't want to lose access to some of those privileges, but I'm not traveling yeah. right now. So, it, you know, I just need to keep telling myself, Nicole, it doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> you might get there again. Um, and even then those privileges, I find them much more important on business travel than I do personal travel. So like my behaviors in one context versus another are probably very different, you know? Um, so yeah, that's a sob story. That's really, um, (laughs) first world problems. Um, but you know, this idea of light and heavy buyers, both light and heavy category buyers and light and heavy brand buyers, um, this refer the, the law that sort of underpins what we say around this is called um, the law of buying frequencies or the negative binomial distribution. And so what we when we look at brand customer bases, and I can put my hand on heart and say irrefutably, pretty much every customer base I've looked at completely conforms to this, is that every customer base is made up of dominantly light buyers, whether you call them uh, infrequent buyers, so people buying once or twice in a period or people spending a very small amount of money, um, if you're talking about services. Um, and there are fewer medium buyers and fewer heavier buyers again. So you have this really skewed distribution of a huge number of the people that you sell to buy you once or twice in a year. Uh, and research looking at, uh, in, in specifically consumer goods, looking at the, the Pareto share, um, which I'm not sure if you know, the Pareto share came about looking at land holdings in Italy and that um, 20% of, of landholders owned 80% of the, the land um, at the time. And so it was assumed that in branding, so again, another shoehorn that the top 20% of customers contribute 80% of sales, whereas the bottom 80% contribute only 20% of sales. Uh, And that's not the case in the consumer um, goods that we've looked at. It tends to be uh, the top 20% contributes 50 to 60% or the bottom 80% contributes about 40 to 50% of sales. So a very big group that still has a reasonable amount of ma- value. They they contribute mm-hmm. to half of your sales. Um, so so in that respect, they're important. But also remembering that we're looking at this at a fixed point in time. A light buyer today is not necessarily a light buyer tomorrow. People mm-hmm. update, yeah. not tomorrow, but next year. So if you're looking from a perspective of future growth, if your brand grows, you will acquire 
all types of buyers, lights, mediums, and heavies. But when a brand grows, when we've observed this, it increases predominantly in the number of light buyers, as in those that have gone from non-buyers to one-time buyers or two-time buyers. You get you get some, but proportionally less mediums and heavies. Um, so you get more of all types of buyers, which raises the purchase frequency or the loyalty metric. Um, but you'll still always have more light buyers. And when brands and categories grow, it's by increasing penetration, which occurs mainly through those light buyers. Mm -hmm. So it's not something you can change. And so you always need to have front and center, I need to recruit more light buyers. And that's that's counterintuitive to the whole ROI thing to spend money to get a low value customer. But, you know, collectively, they are reasonable value. And, and that is in the repertoire type of markets for them, like the the 50% is light and 50% is medium to heavy, or is it true in, in, from what you've seen in subscription as well? Um, in, in subscription, the pricing starts playing a role. So it's, mm. it's harder to diagnose right. quite so clearly. And also, um, you know, we're very lucky in consumer goods in that we have these panels that recruit people and are able to scrape all of their purchases. So you get more of a census and more of a precise read on what people are doing and buying and spending. Mm -hmm. That is less evident in subscription markets. But when we've looked at, say, claimed data, you know, often we see the same patterns occurring. Um, I wouldn't say it's precisely those figures. Um, but, ag again, if, you know, you, you can look at a, each heavy individual customer and go, you're worth a million dollars to my brand. But in terms of risk, you go, if I, if I focus, you can't just recruit those people. You'll inevitably have lots of lights. Um, if I focus all of my effort on, on just having those, well, life happens and you can't always retain them. Like in terms of risk, it's really risky to sort of put all your eggs in those heavy buyer baskets. So, so you want a balanced, a, a balanced customer base to some mm -hmm. degree, knowing mm -hmm. that there will inevitably be some churn. Even growing brands have defection rates. Um, it's just the, the way things happen. Mm -hmm. you, uh, I don't mean to bring back more um, an, another airline example, but I think yeah. the, just the way that you're speaking about it right now actually makes so much sense. Because when you think about how many people travel once, maybe twice in a year, those people aren't going to accumulate enough points to take advantage of some of those um, privileges, if you will, of those high status members who fly frequently. So those individuals mm. would be considered light buyers, right? Your heavy buyers yes. are your business travelers and whatnot. And then I think that furthers the idea because I think we, we just did a podcast with Graham Stapleton from, and, and Jorge Algon from, from Cantar, and they were talking about brands are basically shortcuts for the brain. Right. And the way that you're bringing that to life. So that plays an even more important low for the light buyer, because the light buyer, because yeah. they haven't built that affinity, I don't want to call it loyalty. I want to be careful how I use the word loyalty mm -hmm. to a specific product or service. You have to make sure you're building those memory structures. Yes. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, I I agree with everything you're saying there. Um, in, in terms of like the airline industry, you know, having a loyalty program is kind of a hygiene factor at the end of the yeah. day. Everyone That's has one. Point. So is it is it really, is that what's really moving the dial on growth? Um, your point about a light buyer will never graduate to those. You, you could flip it and look at price promotions, you know, when you price promote, because eventually what, effectively what you're doing is giving away margin for free on, on, some, yeah. on some level. Um, but, you know, so what, what I always find really fascinating is um, we want these heavy buyers that are, are doing lots and spending lots and we want to make them solely loyal. But the when we look at sole loyals, they are most likely to be ca uh, light category buyers. So if you only come into the category once in a time period, mm -hmm. by default, you are solely loyal, right? Mm -hmm. Right. You can only buy one brand at that purchase. So so what we see is that, you know, when we look at sole oils, they tend to be really light. And when we look at heavier buyers that typically have bigger repertoires of brands that they use because they're coming into the categories lots, they're variety seeking, they're, they're choosing different brands, that's the norm. Um, uh, when we 
when we look at those, they're not solely loyal. They have bigger repertoires and, and so they're, they're share of category requirements is going to multiple brands. So, you know, this idea that we want a really loyal base and it's going to all be heavy buyers, it just really right. flies in the face of all the evidence um, that's there. And, uh, and, you know, the idea that a light buyer is, is not a good thing and a heavy buyer is a good thing, you know, it, it's in part a function of, of category buying as well, um, which I think people can forget about sometimes. Great points. Yeah. Um I wanted to ask about, and again, this is still in like the fundamentals part because it's there. It's when I think about it's funny, like when I think about a lot of this stuff that you guys have, have published and brought to light, when I think about it, I'm like, oh, yeah, right. Okay. Well, if I go buy coffee, like I just bought another kind of coffee today, I'm like, I don't remember if I bought the last, same kind of coffee the last like five times that I bought coffee for my house. Probably not. Maybe same brands but not the same like flavor for sure um and so i'm constantly like i'm loyal to coffee i'm a heavy coffee drinker probably but i'm not loyal to any particular brand because i keep trying all these different ones um and so i think about that i'm like yeah yeah that makes tons of sense yeah right like maybe ketchup is the only thing that i would like (laughs) say is the one thing that i buy the same kind of ketchup every single time but if it's a condiment, and I'm also a condiment freak, and so I have all kinds of condiments I put around. <laughs> You're learning so much about me. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm a so, I'm a sauce fan too, so oh, I'm on board. Oh, I'm so I'm so glad I'm not alone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but so when it comes to that, though, what I realize over time, and and you you touch V touched a little bit on this in his last question about um, coming to mind, building memory structures. You guys talk a lot about mental and physical availability, and as a path to growth and it's now that I've mm-hmm. seen it, I go, Oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But I would never have thought about that before I heard about it through you and your team. So can you talk about mm. that a bit? Yeah. Well, um, so, you know, accepting the principle that the sustainable route to growth is, is penetration. Therefore customer acquisition is, is super important. Uh, how do you go about that? Well, from all the other evidence that we've seen, um, to us, we we kind of take it back to to the two pillars or or market based assets of mental availability and physical availability, and and given that the whole um, cognitive miserly, you know not a lot of conviction around a lot of decisions made in very short time. Uh, mental availability is the ease with which um, or the probability of your brand being thought of across buying situations and increasing that probability because if you are in the race, um, you have a better chance of being bought than if you're not. So, you know, a lot of uh, – and that whole conversion mindset um, and, you know, small brands, the problem isn't that they're rejected. They're just – rarely ever thought of. And, and and the other half of that is that you want these two market-based assets to overlap because with physical availability, it's how easy it is to buy you. And obviously mm-hmm. digital has made that significantly easier um, yeah. and, and created a lot of categories. Uh, but at the same time, in a lot of categories, the bulk of purchasing is still brick and mortar physical retail. So mm-hmm. you, you've got to have that imbalance. But physical availability does refer to not only the, the physical, physical availability, but the digital accessibility mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, then, and then what bridges those two things is, is your, your branding, your distinctive assets, um, which make you uh, easier to recognize in, the, in, for mental availability, the things that will build that are things, uh, you know, direct experience has a role, but, you know, you can advertise or you can, uh, you know, there's word of mouth out there that can help build those memory structures and mental availability. Um, With physical availability, it's being in more touch points and having and being recognisable and easy to find. Mm -hmm. So, you know, easy to buy, easy to find, um, and then easy to think of. Because if you're not thought of, uh, you know, we, we do bias our purchases towards brands that we are familiar with. And that's, that's what's part of mental availability is all about. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if this is happening um, in Australia where you are, but uh, V, I don't know if you've noticed, like all of our grocery stores are substituting all these brands that they brought in for their own um, branded packaging and stuff like that 
And it's making me crazy because yeah. I can't buy the stuff I used to like. And I have to now I'm, I'm forced to buy like the co-op brand of whatever mm -hmm. or the Safeway so brand. That, that yeah. tells me that you're not, you don't like going to Aldi, Mark. Well, I, so I, I don't, I don't <laughs> only know about Aldi, but I don't know about Aldi. Yeah. Like I don't, because we don't have it here, I don't think. So are they their own, mm. are they all their own product? Uh, yes, predominantly they, they stock, they don't stock national brands very much. Mm. Um, in, in Australia, back to your question, and sorry for interrupting, but um, no. back to your question, um, private labels aren't as prolific in Australia as they are in the US or the UK. Uh, they, they certainly, and, and in some categories more than others, but, you know, um, here national brands still dominate. I, someone will probably tell me I'm wrong in some instances, but in my mind, in the major retailers, mm -hmm. uh, which here are Coles and Woolworths, the shelves are predominantly stocked with, with national brands. It, yeah. And it, I just brought that up because it like, it's such a real example of physical availability. Like I just can't buy the right. stuff anymore, even though they may be advertising mm. it, I can't get it. Mm. No. And so, so physical availability is, is super important. Um, you know, and I, d I don't shop on, I don't do my grocery shopping online for sure. And so, you know, I do rely on what's in front of me and, and, and in a physical space, that shelf is a lot less flexible. There are fewer items there than what you can have in an online store, but then in an online store, then, you know, what's on the, the top fold is, is mm -hmm. pretty critical as well. Yeah. The discovery component is really hard, a, a much mm. different experience. Mm, absolutely. Although the laws still hold in that environment, funnily enough, um, you know, you, you could anticipate in an, yeah. in an online world um, that, that loyalty levels would be much higher, that people would um, have a shopping basket that they just every week they go click buy that again. Um, but no, it's not what we see. Hmm. Fascinating. Mm. I did not expect that. No, <laughs> no. The world is full of wonderfully surprising things. Yeah. The the last one that, you know, when we're talking a little, little bit about the mental availability, even the mind structures and whatnot, naturally one of the main growth levers, I think, or drivers that, you know, marketers really have is like that age old question between reach and frequency or finding that optimum state between both. Uh, can you help us understand what your take on that, um, uh, I guess, on, on those characteristics there? Sure. Um, reach, if, if you have a penetration strategy, reach is non-negotiable. You need to reach millions and millions of people to sort of nudge them towards buying your brand. Um, with, a, with a restricted budget, arguably there is a trade-off between reach and frequency that, that can be achieved. And, and if you are using the old school of, of minimum frequency three plus, then, then you inevitably reduce your reach um, to achieve the frequency. Um, mm -hmm. so, so reach is really important in that sense. But there's actually another empirical generalization that isn't talked about a whole lot, uh, which uh, the uh, advertising uh, convex response function, um, which is just a fancy way for saying a, a curve. And, you know, <laughs> what is found is um, that each additional exposure has diminishing returns. Uh, mm, okay. In and again, I will caveat that is limited to um, packaged goods predominantly. The evidence is, um, and predominantly to established brands. But uh, when we look at when we separate households into buckets, um, looking at uh, one those that were exposed once versus twice versus three times and so on, and this is in a in a either a seven day or a twenty eight day window, and when we benchmark. Uh, brand sales or market share against unexposed households because you know and I know that we buy lots of things that we don't see advertising for so that's our sort of baseline and when we look at how advertising impacts those exposed households the biggest return or the biggest increase comes from those households that were exposed once um, more frequency is good so we see an, an incremental benefit from a second exposure and a third but eventually that flattens out and and so the principle being that if I had two dollars 
to spend and assuming I could buy two exposures for that, do I want to reach two households once or one household twice? Mm -hmm. And the answer is it'd be better to reach two households once, um, Hmm. both from an effectiveness and an efficiency standpoint. So, um, yeah, that's that's why, you know, our, our principle is reach with continu- one plus reach with continuity over time is is a core tenet of, of what we see as effective media planning. Um, there is – just before we get off the idea of, like, the, the fundamentals and the laws of marketing, I mean, I just want to – you probably can make the point better, but like, this is not just a couple guys like V and I sitting around doing AB tests uh, on a computer screen. Like, <laughs> right. Like when you talk about creating laws, I mean, they're laws, right? I mean, it's mm. like, can you maybe just explain a bit about the statistical validity of something? Cause it's, <laughs> cause it's like, I think it's important that, I used to work in pharmaceuticals and you got approval to use a drug when it was proven to reduce death or an outcome. Like, I mean, these are kind of the same types of things that you guys are proving out. Mm. Not, not death necessarily, yeah. but you know. <laughs> <laughs> death by um, advertisers. Yeah. Oh, grim. Um, yeah. Uh-oh. No, so <laughs> our, Andrew Ehrenberg was a statistician. And, mm-hmm. and so I, I find, you know, and, and part of the Ehrenberg Bass's um, remit is, you know, we're often criticized for doing descriptive research as opposed to super fancy, fancy modeling, um, you mm-hmm. know, AI, ML, you know, played in it, but, you know, it, it often obscures. Um, but you need to do the descriptive work first and and by doing the descriptive work you can find you can find relationships between things and and important relationships as well so andrew ehrenberg was a statistician who worked then then sort of started working in marketing and was like well i wonder if you know these there are there are patterns in buying um the way um you know the that you know, applying that sort of that mindset, and and there are most certainly, and and then it's the repeatability of those findings mm-hmm. that result in a law. So, our our approach to science is is very old fashioned, kind of like you know early agriculture. You go out and you observe a relationship, and you go, hmm, that's interesting. All right, let's let's go into a different context and see if it sits there. And what about for big brands? What about for small brands? What about for emerging markets? What about for Develop markets, um, mm-hmm. so on and so forth, and and you know it's it's interesting because often when we we talk about the laws and people go oh you know laws social sciences that's not really a thing, mm-hmm. um, and then someone will go but what about this exceptional result you know and it, it's to be like Apple Harley Davidson or Tesla uh, mm-hmm. uh, are normally those put up as, as sort of these exceptional growth examples um, without advertising or high levels of loyalty or whatever it is. Um, and you know what? I I will tell you there are idiosyncrasy idiosyncrasies to to any market category, mm-hmm. whatever it is, um, and there can be deviations to laws, and they can be isolated or when they repeat. Well, then we found a boundary condition for that law. Mm-hmm. So you know, as one example, when you, you've spoken about private labels, they often look a little different in in double jeopardy. Uh, they look like they have excess loyalty when really you can frame it as they have um, a deficit in penetration because when you look at the data, right, um, private labels have restricted distribution. They're only available in one store. Mm-hmm. So these two metrics, penetration appreciates all buyers, whereas purchase frequency is only looking at those that bought the brand. So because of that restricted distribution, if you're looking at the whole market across all stores, a private label doesn't sell to everyone because not everyone went into that store. Mm -hmm. So its penetration looks low, but its purchase frequency looks comparatively high. Right. So, but when you restrict the data set to only looking at people that shopped in that stores, well, then they start to look normal. And so it's an artifact of the data. And so it's this kind of investigation and curiosity that's that's super mm-hmm. important um, in marketing science. And obviously I'm, I'm going on a bit of a rant, but, you know, the point is, is that a deviation or an outlier doesn't refute the law or doesn't undermine it to the point that it doesn't exist anymore. These, these laws are actually quite 
interesting and freeing in terms of what you don't need to worry about anymore mm-hmm. versus what matters. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks for saying that. Cause it, it's, it's certainly helpful. Cause I just don't want people to think this is just something that, like some other marketing guru made up. You know what I mean? Totally. Like, Oh, I'm no. going <laughs> to call this new thing, uh, the Binkley paradox. And it's <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like it's just like, they're, I mean, if I, I really would encourage anybody like type in double jeopardy and look at a Google search and look at all the different categories that come up as yeah. an example, like the repeatability part is so profound. Mm. And so, and you I know, think- whenever you see an isolated finding, replic- the best test of whether it's valid, important is replication. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. And, you know, in, in academia, you know, more and more, it's hard, to, it's hard to publish failed replications. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of, a lot of journals want new and new and interesting stuff, just like marketing practitioners do. And so they'll, you know, publish these exceptional findings, um, these, these new breaking grounding findings, and then a bunch of other people try and replicate it and they can't. And then, and then, but that's what science is, mm-hmm. um, trying to get close to the truth by, mm-hmm. by, um, looking at the same thing over and over again, but in different conditions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to skip over some of the things we talked about before, uh, or had written up and prepared for V, if you don't mind. I also just want to jump into Thanks. like tie in the research part and the paper that you came up with last year, what happens when brands stop advertising? Mm-hmm. Cause I found that so fascinating. Um, Cause there's always this thing, like it happens almost every day when I talk to my friends, Oh, you're marketing. Oh, ads don't work on me. I'm like, oh, mm. okay. <laughs> they don't. Yeah. Um, and so um, if you, I just would love to like hear more about that paper that you published and, and the research you did. Cause it's, sure. it's fascinating. Yeah, no, happy. Um, uh, the, the, when advertising stops, work or when broad broad or mass mass reach advertising stops but, but that that point you made about advertising doesn't work on me it's a really interesting point because it but it always ties back into the buyer behavior stuff in that most people have a real really low probability to buy any brand so if you're a classic light buyer you have a one in 365 chance of buying a brand tomorrow or if you're a really, really light buyer, it's like a one in a thousand chance you buy once every three years. Um, the really important job of advertising and, and the really unrecognized one is that advertising will, will, if it reaches them, will just say it increases their probability of buying from one in 365 chances to what two in 365 chances, like really minor effect, like hitting them with a feather, but it's, it's a doubling of sales, all else being equal. Mm-hmm. Other thing, things get in the way of that actually playing out. But the, but the other part of that is they, they won't rush out and buy tomorrow. Advertising effects are spread out really thinly over time. And that's why it can be very difficult to build the case for, for, spending on advertising or, or that it, that it works. Um, and, and so the advertising stops work was, was interesting because it's like, well, let's demonstrate its value by what happens in the presence of its absence, so mm-hmm. to speak. Um, and, and so that work came about, we had a, um, we were given some data from an alcoholic beverages company in Australia, uh, and, it was 20 years, 20 consecutive years of data from the mid nineties, uh, both sales, volume sales, uh, and, um, advertising spend, uh, annually across broad reach media. Uh, internet came in a little bit more as time went over like display advertising, but it didn't include search or social media or, um, uh, sponsorships, stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. so there, there are, you know, holes in it, but you know, it's, it's still great data to have that amount, um, for a large number of brands. Uh, and, and so what we did was, well, we looked at all the brands and our first step was going, well, how many of these brands stopped advertising and for how long? 
Mm-hmm. And our interest, because, you know, advertising affects decay and the estimate of decay is somewhere between one and nine months. So, you know, at least a year of stopping advertising should um, get past that decay effect of past advertising coming forward. Um, so we we had a, a, a decision rule of um, an ad, a brand had to go dark for at least one full calendar year. And so we were able to collect um, almost 60 cases from just over 40 brands that had stopped advertising for at least one year all the way through to 10 years. Although after five years um, of, of stop, our sample sizes got very small. So um, uh, we sort of just focus on the on the first five years. But that meant we could have, you know, repeated observations in natural, in, in natural market competition of what happens to sales when brands go dark for for extended periods of time. Uh, And the finding was that um, on average, sales on the magnitude or the change in sales was typically negative Mm -hmm. um, across brands. So the average change in sales was um, after the first year was a decline of 16%. uh, And then uh, I need a check the numbers after the two years it was 25 percent and after three years it was 36 percent and 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 it, it kind of continued on that trajectory um leveling off so uh you know that's not to say that every brand was the average brand so we also looked at um how often brands did decline and so in that first year uh without advertising it was a 50 50 split effectively between brands hmm. that declined versus didn't so it's kind of like a coin flip. Um, but then, you know, as time goes on, decline becomes more inevitable. And as of four years without advertising, none of those brands were at their baseline sales before the stops because we, we indexed against um, sales in the last advertised year. So we could compare across all the different brands. Mm. Uh, and then to try and understand that a bit better, we we separated the brands out into some different conditions. So we separated out by um, prior trajectory. So we looked at in the in the in the year prior to the last advertised year, was the brand growing, stable, or declining? Because one of the challenges with this research is, you know, what kind of brand stops advertising? It must have been in trouble. Right. Uh, so so we were able to establish. Well, actually, it was about a third. Of, of growing stable and declining brands that stopped advertising. And, and so when we split the results out by that, uh, we found that growing and stable brands were able to, were, were less likely to decline and, and were able to stay stable on average for a couple of years without advertising. Mm-hmm. From that point, they were typically re-advertised if they were growing or stable. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, marketers able to get investment advertising investment back into the brand, whereas quite, you know, naturally declining brands continue to decline and quite steeply. Uh, but we also separated it out by brand size. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we found that big brands uh, were able to weather the stop um, and and on average stay stable for a year or two and, and medium brands as well. Uh, and, and, and we expected that on some degree because of their established market-based assets, right? Their established mental availability, their established physical availability. Um, and because we're looking mm. at proportional change, we're calculating from a bigger mm. base. So the proportional change will always be flattened a bit. Um, whereas smaller brands are tended to suffer more immediate and, um, and, and substantive declines from the outset without advertising. I, I mean, I, I'm... I wish I could show the picture and we'll put a link to the research in, in the notes and stuff. But I mean, mm-hmm. the picture is just fascinating because I, I I'm seeing it in my head and I following along the picture in my head as you're describing it, but it's fascinating to me. Like I feel like so much of the stuff we talked about in the fundamentals is actually a really good, um, provides a good explanation as to how, why those results were the way they were. Like, so for example, the size of a brand having a large number of customers and a large footprint, both mental and physical availability is almost like a, um, I don't want to say an antidote, but it's a prevention for rapid decay, whereas smaller brands that don't have that mental and physical availability, it, it they're more affected by changes. Is that fair to say? 
Yeah, I, um, small brands are proportionately more dependent on those light buyers, light brand buyers, mm-hmm. when you look at their their customer bases. And, and when you think about a light buyer, you know, you have a very unstable toehold in their head. They barely buy you. They think of you even less, arguably. And so, you know, mass broad reach advertising reaches out to them like millions of those people. And so if you take that away, you know, you've taken away the key mechanism to sort of keep that toehold. And and so that relates to when we see brands growing and declining, the biggest changes are in those, those in penetration, and that's linked to the large number of light buyers. So, you know, the mental availability theory is is a good fit for for what we're seeing here, and that you you've lost that refreshment and reinforcement, um, and, and so therefore mental availability erodes. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, what I think really kind of resonates with me right now is thinking about again the mental structures and and everything that brands need to elicit to assure that there's that affinity. But as marketers, our probably our most important role that we have for our organizations is how do we build longevity, right? Mm-hmm. And I think, and maybe this is where I would love to your opinion on is how can we as marketers manage and protect that identity for the long term? Is there a, uh, uh, what's it called? A, um, a Coles Notes version of here's your marketing 101 to build longevity for the next 100 years? Or is it a little more complicated than that? Um, so here we're just to clarify, we are talking about brand identity. So distinctive assets. Um, yeah. Yes, Um, yes, yes. No, absolutely. So it, it's, there are some sort of ideas and, and some of those are in, um, my colleague, uh, Jenny Romanek, her book, building distinctive assets. Mm -hmm. Um, in that last chapter, she talks about a distinctive asset management system, um, which, you know, uh, to me, there are, there are a few really core important things. Um, the first being you need to declare what you want to own, right? Um, you know, it, it just it doesn't magically fall together by itself. Uh, so, you know, when we're working with brands, you know, we, we have a recommended distinctive asset palette. So a, a set of, of four to six distinctive assets maybe um, depending on on the brand and, and its activities and so forth. But, um, you know, you need to declare what you want to own, logo, tagline, character, advertising, moment, uh, sonic device or audio device, you know. Um, and, and then you need to be very uh, conscientious, conscientious and committed to building that asset and, and and committing to the long term, so you just said a hundred years. You know, we're not we're not talking three to five year plans or ten year plans. We're talking the brand's lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, you want an asset to not just outlive your tenure at a company, but to outlive you on this planet, so to speak. You know, you want mm-hmm. it to be there for a hundred, two hundred years, assuming the brand yeah. still exists. Um, And, you know, and and so that takes real commitment. And part of that process, if you're looking to actively build an asset, make it strong, part of that is you need to make sure it's present in every single touch point. So part of that means incorporating distinctive assets into your ad briefs, into Mm -hmm. your sales activation briefs, Um, and then looking at all of your activities. And if an asset that you're trying to build isn't there, you need to ask, well, why is it not there? Mm -hmm. Because because that's an opportunity lost for that reach and reinforcement. Um, and, and then there's also good execution within that touch point in that when you're building an asset, um, whatever it is, it needs to be in close proximity to the brand name, either visually or verbally, because mm-hmm. that's how learning happens, associative learning. We make connections between things that are presented together in, in time or in space. And then layered on top of that, I would always say in your organization, nominate a distinctive asset champion, someone that's super passionate about it uh, and that is tasked or made responsible for for building that asset to, to go through that process. And, you know, and then the old adage of what gets measured gets managed comes in. If you're not measuring your assets, then you're mm-hmm. probably not doing much with them either. Mm-hmm. That's great. There's, I mean... There's not enough time on the planet for me to like talk to you about stuff. Uh, so 
maybe I could say that like, I have these all these sound bites rolling through my head that you've mentioned. Like one was the, the distinctive asset. I think you said was something like um, the interface between mental and physical availability, I think is how you said it. And it's such a for me, as I'm chewing on that idea and you're describing distinctive assets and managing that, I, I see that as such an important role because you're showing people, let's say on an ad or some kind of um, mental availability device, um, your brand, what it's for, building those associations. And then somebody shows up to the store or their app or whatever, and it should look the same. So you create that expectation. Um I guess maybe, you know, as I'm thinking about the thing I want to ask, like what really makes a great ad? Because I know there's other components. And in the book, the marketing book, you guys use the Old Spice campaign as a case study. I don't know if that's okay. the greatest ad of all time, or but if there's like, like what is the anatomy of, maybe it's not even just an ad because it's also, it needs to have like a call and response almost where it's the call of the ad plus the response of the shelf or digital mm -hmm. presence. Like what, what yeah. makes that great experience? Um, it's so tough, like, because, you know, the Old Spice ad, I wouldn't say the Old Spice is a, is a, is a poster child for having a distinctive asset. Cause it's not, there's not really anything in there that you would class as a distinctive asset that evokes the brand beyond the brand name itself because mm. that was a, a big relaunch campaign right it had been yeah. unadvertised and struggling and so they they innovated on it they changed all the packaging mm -hmm. they went for a really big sales push and and were successful um which, which kind of speaks to the point that not every ad that includes a distinctive asset will be successful mm -hmm. so you know anything i've learned because most of my well not most of my research some of the research that I love the most that I've done is looking at creativity and, and what is the, what makes a sales effective ad. Mm -hmm. And, and if I've learned anything in that process, um, they're hard, great ads like old spice are, are really hard to predict and mm -hmm. no one tactic is a silver bullet for success. Um, and there's no formula or foolproof winning combination that works every single time. You know, it, it's about odds and understanding the risk attached to to some creative approaches based on data of what has and hasn't worked in the past. And I think a lot of advertisers really have a dearth of data on on advertising history. I feel like most campaigns are, are created from a blank page mm -hmm. um, or a very what's in vogue and and you know headlining at can at the time mm -hmm. um you know with the old spice campaign in terms of what it includes that i have seen in the data that i've looked at linking to sales effectiveness um it includes humor i think humor is a incredibly underrated uh tactic lots mm -hmm. of advertisers don't use it it's hard to do well mm -hmm. it does again if you use humor you're not guaranteed to succeed mm -hmm. but the odds of having a more effective ad, a higher when you use humor in, in what the data I've seen, um, having a speaking character. So voiceovers, um, the work I've done finds that they reduce the odds of sales effectiveness. So if you have a character speaking, um, mm -hmm. that relates to sort of the biological imperative of we were attracted to faces and eyes um, mm -hmm. on some level as well, but that can also include animated characters. This ad also has a bit of animation where, you know, he goes from a bathroom to a boat and then yeah. he's got diamonds and a shell and then yeah. he's on a horse. <laughs> you know, there's a level of, of, of computer CGI in there and, and that suspends reality and I've found that increases the odds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's also reasonably well branded in that it has relatively early introduction. It's dual mode. Um, the the brand is spoken as well as shown, and and so this is where my head always goes breaking it down into those mm. really quite discrete objective tactics. Mm -hmm. And and so that's where I would say Old Spice works. Most people would argue it was based on a, a beautiful insight that women do the shopping, and the, the men are using the ladies soap and they should be using a man's soap and and so it and and like that's great it's awesome um but i i think more in terms of what i know having done mm -hmm. the number crunching and the cross tabulating if you use this tactic mm -hmm. more often ads are successful than not 
you know what's interesting and, and, and that's often quite jarring because you know it tries to arguably it tries to reduce creative down into its component parts and making it quite you know scientific and and I will not say that I don't want to stop any kind of creative process I have immense respect for creativity mm-hmm. and there are some ads that are lightning in a bottle that you could never replicate or have anticipated yeah. they were as good as they were so we're never going to be able to predict everything but having an evidence based approach to creating advertising mm-hmm. is better than just shooting from the hip and using our judgment I just wanted to add there something and, you know, uh, Mark and I both have had, uh, you know, we both worked together at a, at a retailer, sports retailer uh, here in Canada. And what was interesting is that year after year, we went by the same playbook, right? So it's like, this is when your back to school sale would go live. Here's when your winter sale would go live and, and whatnot. And during that time, it was easy because if you're, say, your your um, your winter coats weren't selling, well, it hasn't snowed yet. So we were just waiting for it to snow, and then it would sell, right? And what I'm hearing, though, even from the example of the Old Spice or the, you know, the, the idea of, like, lightning in a bottle, it's like, as marketers, take calculated risk. It's okay to be risky, I think, at times, if mm. you want to really extend into those um, into that other stratosphere, of, of, mm-hmm. if you will, of, of, of brand affinity, right? Because if you're not taking those risks and you're going by a playbook, and I'm sure it's there for a reason, there's seasonality behind it, there's data to support why we're putting back to school on right now. But there has to be a way of like, how do you, how do you, I'm, not, I'm probably not using the right words here, but how do you go above and beyond and mm-hmm. create a campaign or, or an ad like the Old Spice that it came out of nowhere? I remember when that hit and everyone was talking about it because it was so disruptive or different than anything else that we had seen. Mm. No, and and, and I'm, I'm kind of worried in what I just said as well in that I, I don't want to diminish because the question started from distinctive assets, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and, and, and creativity is typically about taking things that exist and making new combinations of those or, or doing something that's pushing the envelope, whereas, mm-hmm. you know, branding. So distinctive assets, their contribution to that wonderful advertising magic soup is that they uh, branding is a, is a necessary but insufficient condition for, for success, right? If people mm-hmm. don't know mm-hmm. who's advertising, it's going to have a very low likelihood right. of influencing what they do. So distinctive assets, part of the appeal of those is that they are inherently creative devices themselves. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to weave them into into a creative piece and have it elevate the branding quality Mm -hmm. of that ad is much more natural than just a name. Mm -hmm. So that's why characters, they can often be, they can can be there from the very beginning of the ad. Yeah. But equally, you know, don't assume that your asset is strong because in the experimentation I've done, and, and this was some of the first research I did, was looking at is a distinctive asset equivalent to using a brand name exposure in ads in terms of eliciting brand linkage or, or brand linkage scores? Mm-hmm. And the answer was that sometimes yes, but sometimes no, because it's a harder mental task, right? You're asking people to see something or hear something, or if you're talking in real life, you know, smell something or feel something and evoke and pull the brand name out of their head. Um, It's an indirect path to branding. So it always carries some risk because there's always going to be a risk of retrieval failure for those that do know the connection. Mm -hmm. And there are inevitably some people who haven't learned that the gecko means Geico or that a swoosh means Nike um, and, and so, you know, some brands try to run before they've walked and go, mm-hmm. we've got a really strong asset, but they haven't done that teaching the building or education yeah. job. Yeah. Great point. Um, so when you have a strong asset, it, it, it has a lot to offer, but equally, I will say that including a distinctive asset in the air, in an ad, like mere presence, a does not mean it will be noticed and therefore elicit the brand and does not mean that the ad will be sales effective by default as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's a great point. Fair. But it has better odds, arguably. Yeah. 
Like I, I, I wish I knew. I mean, you, actually, you might know the answer to this. The Nike swoosh and the word Nike mm-hmm. were paired. Mm-hmm. I feel like it was for twenty years or something like that. Like there was a long period of time where they just always put the two of them together, mm-hmm. and then they finally removed yeah. it. Yeah. Well, but they they need to keep pairing it again. So for those. Mm-hmm little kids that need to learn that association, those first time category entrants that, you know, don't really notice advertising because they've never bought Nike before because we have this profound ability to screen in things that are relevant to us, which are the brands we already buy and screen out the ones that we don't, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's hard advertising to light and non-buyers because they're less likely to see you, not because they're rejecting Mm -hmm. you, but because their brains just aren't geared to to do that job mm-hmm. yet. Um, have you got time for one more question or, or one for me? And uh, the, I, I don't, I like, <laughs> I, I feel getting, so, getting bad. Right now. I'm like, <laughs> so bad. Um, so, cause I, I don't know if how comfortable you are talking about category entry points. Cause it for me is another part of good ads mm-hmm. and it's a, a, like, the most common way I would say of, of measuring ad effect, and especially on the brand side, people will instantly default to like, well, let's check brand awareness. And, mm-hmm. and I kind of like have, having discovered category entry points, I feel like brand awareness is insufficient because it's not brand specific awareness. enough yep. to link it to the purchase point of purchase or the trigger uh, or the yep. category trigger of of purchase. I don't know if I'm saying that properly. Brand awareness is at its core and and it is a complicated measure in and of itself. You know, you can measure it in different ways, but at its core, it's identifying category membership, right? Mm -hmm. Do you understand that the brand belongs or sells this thing? Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, uh, Andrew Ehrenberg, his his theory of advertising was awareness trial reinforcement. And awareness is kind of where it starts. Mm-hmm. And and it's probably uh, the first step. You know, some pe- most people probably don't buy brands that they're not aware of, but some do. You know, sometimes you you buy something and sure. you didn't really pay any attention to what brand it was. If it's, it's probably more common in, you know, you probably don't see that much in airline sales, for example, as a category we've been talking about. But um, yeah. you know, just don't random roulette what what thing you're paying for. Um, yeah. So, so it is the starting point because you know, if you think about how memory is organized, um, um, associative network theory. Uh, the brand is sort of the central node that exists in people's head, that core memory. And then over time, you you link that into all sorts of different things. Mm-hmm. Um, some of those things are category entry points. And arguably, those things are really important because category entry points are the needs, motivations, situations people find themselves in when they're buying from the category. So they're what people are thinking out about before they think of brands, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm thinking, you know, uh, today I'm, I'm doing a presentation, I'm going to need some water handy. Um, so I need to make a water purchase. So I'm thinking about, you know, I'm going to be speaking for a while going to get a water uh at which point you know has this brand made any attempt at at communicating well when you're speaking for a while we're an option Mm -hmm. um so but then you know the way memory works through cued retrieval is that therefore these category entry points what they represent are are cues or doorways into the brand and and often you know marketers we think about well what do we want to be linked to Mm-hmm. And that's where they think from the brand to whatever else the queue is. So we're often thinking quite like we want to be innovative. We want to be better quality. We want to be um, aspirational. We want to be purposeful. Purpose. Yeah. Where, whereas you, yeah. where you really need to step back and go, well, what are people thinking about when they're buying mm-hmm. before they even think of brands? Um, because that's that's where a lot of that activity can, can fall over mm-hmm. quite badly. Mm. So fascinating. It's great. Great yeah. stuff. I love the work you do. It's amazing. It's so good. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. <laughs> so how can how can people find out more about you? Uh, about me? Um, 
probably your work. the easiest. Yeah. And work. Um, LinkedIn is a good is a good avenue. Um, I once tried to give someone a business card and they laughed in my face <laughs> and said, I'll just find you on LinkedIn. That was mortifying. Um, <laughs> Um, but our, our website is marketingscience.info. Uh, all of that's there. Uh, we are around the traps at conferences. You can buy our books, How Brands Grow, How Brands Grow Part 2, uh, Marketing. Uh, you've got it in front of you, Mark. Evidence Practice, mm -hmm. Theory Evidence Practice. Second edition. <laughs> um, hey. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but me personally, LinkedIn is probably the easiest way to find me. Awesome. Nicole, thanks so much for doing this. This has just been such a joy for me to chat with you. And um, this is great. I love it. Thank you. No, it's been great fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. For Nicole. your curiosity and, and for, for fun questions. And now the post-pod discussion with V and Mark. Post-pod. Post-pod, V. This is good, man. Yeah. What a conversation with Nicole. Oh, I love that. There's so much I, good stuff in there. And if, if, if our listeners could see the notes and the questions that we had and how many of them we actually were able to check off just because <laughs> yeah, of That's true. <laughs> the, the depth that you could literally go down in each of the questions that we had. It's just, you know, we, we were half joking with, with Nicole just when we, when we logged off there that there is so much substance and we're able to apply science now to our discipline, which yeah. makes this more and more interesting for us as marketers yeah. as we navigate the boardrooms, our peers and everything. And it's, yeah. how can you not get excited totally. by talking to it's uh, like discovering, people like Nicole? Yeah. Something that you found out, like you've been like doing for a long time, marketing, whether you love it or not, but you've been doing it for yeah. a long time. And all of a sudden you discover brand new stuff about it and it's like super fun and ener energizing and the, exactly. I, I will say the one thing when i first started reading a lot of the work from the amber bass institute um including nicole's work I, like mm -hmm. it threw me for a loop because it's what i thought was up is down and what is down is left <laughs> and then like or what was like right is green and i'm like i whoa what and so, time out, please. Time out. <laughs> I know. So it took a while for me to wrap my head around stuff because it's just so different. Like the loyalty thing, right? Totally. Um, it's a function in most markets. It's a function of it's predictable based on the market share of a company. And it, loyalty exists, but it's just not nearly the, you know, thing that we all thought it was like the people getting tattoos of harley davidson you know on their forehead it's not that you know, it's, it's something else you know it, it is and you know i think we've defined in business loyalty as something very specific that is you know it's happening only for your brand and i love the um if you will the the distinction between repertoire and subscription that nicole mm -hmm. kind of talked about but using the airline industry as an example, I think is a fascinating one because the majority of the population doesn't have more than one or two repeat purchases in a year. Yeah. So you're not building loyalty or gaining the points or doing all these other things that you would naturally think. So an airline will look at that and say, well, my highest margin is coming from my premium travelers, my business travelers, because mm -hmm. I'm charging them X amount for the, those seats. I'm the trade-off is all these experiences, mm -hmm. which is great, but it's what, maybe five, six, 10, 15% yeah. of your total base where the mass, if you will, is coming from these light purchasers or um, mm -hmm. buyers that Nicole kind of articulated. So for me, it's when I'm thinking about positioning a brand, are you positioning for that 10% or are you mm -hmm. positioning for the 90%? Mm -hmm. And if you're positioning for the 90%, your message is going to be a lot different than it is for that 10%. Mm -hmm. But all too often, you see it in the industry where they're they're prioritizing the, heavy the business traveler, the heavy yeah. buyers. And it's like, this is where we need to focus our attention to. Yeah. And even even like in our when we go back to our, um, uh, our retail days, yeah. we were targeting the high-end uh, achievers. 
the high end achievers. Yeah. They, right? Yeah, they represent, and they had the numbers, which was interesting because they represented, yeah. I'm going to get the numbers wrong. It doesn't really matter. But for this point of the story, they yeah. represented the fewest um, number of customers, but the highest volume of but purchases. But the highest volume. Yeah. Which is the heavy buyer. Which is wrong. But it went, and yeah, and when it? you think, well, I mean, it, well, it yeah, I, one of the other things <laughs> was interesting after she logged off, um, she mentioned that um, the heavy buyers of today are, are fleeting, right? So, yeah. cause it's dependent on the period of time we're talking about too. So the light buyers exactly. that you have, and I forget what category label we put on them, but the light yeah. sport sporting good buyers of today could be and most likely are your heavy buyers of tomorrow and your heavy buyers of today might not even be a customer in a year from now. Right. Cause you were focusing on the aspirational side that those people that were coming into the category were aspiring to be what that heavy buyer potentially per- was personified. And we did yeah. really a- attach. If you think re- recall all the creative that we would do yeah. was really aspirational. Yeah. So it was like, if you want to get there, here's how you do it. Right. Yeah. And you kind of come through, you go through the process. So it's, it's fascinating to think even that model on its head and say, well, I'm not saying it didn't work because we did yeah, exactly yeah. well during the time. Right. But could well, we have done even better? Yeah. Well, and, and there's also like the heavy buyers are not heavy buyers of just you. They're heavy buyers of the whole category. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, like, great point. so yeah, they're yeah, yeah. buying as much from you as they are probably from, you know, the next largest share competitor and then so on and so forth down the line. Right. But how, however many stores there are available or how many, how available the product is elsewhere in other stores, they're probably buying close to the same percentages with you or as with the others, the exactly. competitors as they are with you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because it's, it's, um, what's it called? Uh, repertoire. It's not subscription. So you mm-hmm. wouldn't find that just for, with, know again using you know sports or yeah. sports retailer it's like where you can find that product and yeah. if you happen to have that product then it's there's an affinity or a loyalty there but if they're yeah. if it's not there they'll go be that heavy buyer somewhere else yeah i i mix up some of these laws in my head all the time because i just i don't remember them as well as i should but um i think it's the duplication of purchase laws that we we're talking about or maybe the binomial distribution either way I think about this all the time when I go get groceries because I'm like, I I grocery stores in my neighborhood. I prefer co-op over Safeway. I choose yeah, not to go too. to Safeway if I don't have to. And yet, yeah. I still like now. I'm making a, a note of myself of, to myself how often I go to Safeway, even though I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, and today know. I went to another place. It was um like a like a organic store. Cause it was just okay. closer. It was nearby yeah. and I wanted to get some like, I don't know, organic meat produce. Yeah. Okay. Right. And so like, and then I start tracking all these grocery stores I go to and I, I would normally have said I'm like a loyal co-op co-op shopper. But when I started looking at it, I'm like the purchase frequency <laughs> at the different grocery stores. It's crazy. <laughs> like I did probably going to like 10 grocery stores in my area that, I didn't even think about it. If you asked me today, like how many grocery stores are there? I would probably have thought two. So then it comes down to really convenience, right? So in some of those instances, it's going to be, you know what? I'm driving by an engagement of, of some sort. I'm going to stop in here because I know we need milk or I know we need some meat or whatever the case may mm-hmm. be. And you'll drop in and then and then go. You're not going to wait for till you come across a co-op, right? Because mm-hmm. it's it's a repeat purchase. It's not something that's happening you know, um, what's called once every quarter. Mm -hmm. So I think that changes your behavior and your loyalties and loyalty. I'm using my Mm -hmm. air quotes here. Uh, And I love the idea of challenging the term loyalty as well, because I think it's from, from a marketing discipline perspective, it's defined as someone or a person that prefers one brand to the next or solely prefers a brand over anything else. Right. Right where you could argue that loyalty is just the affinity towards a brand and maybe not as much has to do with, well, I guess one would argue there is 
the idea of purchase. But as long as it's top of mind, there's a level of loyalty there. Mm-hmm. What I found fascinating when she went into the the context where we talked about reach and frequency, mm-hmm. where she said, if you had two dollars and you can buy, and each household cost a dollar, yeah, it would make more sense to spend to buy two households versus doing hitting one household twice. twice. I love that. Yeah, because then it really kind of helps set up some sort of a framework for yourself when you're thinking about how do I make this challengeable as a mark from a marketing perspective, mm-hmm. my targeting, you're always looking for more. Mm-hmm. And as digital marketers, what have we done? We've receded into like that focused, shown this kind of intent, show them this message. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, may- maybe we have to blow that out again. Maybe mm-hmm. we don't have to be so narrow in our approach. It's a good point. It it really does challenge like the concept of personalization. And I always, I, I struggle with that word even because I think what personalization means for most people is they would say the right message to the right person at the right time. And you do that yeah. for every single person that you reach. I think that's yeah. what most people would mean. Yeah. But personalization really like, that's almost impossible to execute. Um, like you can't do it. Yeah, it's really, really like almost impossible. So, but it's also unnecessary because you can reach a lot of people, especially if you have the category entry point in mind, where you're going to mm-hmm. gain efficiencies on your creative development. If you know what your category entry point is, the predominant one for all buyers in the category, knowing that. Some of them are heavy buyers who already probably know you about you. A lot of yeah. them are light buyers who probably don't or just need a reminder. Mm-hmm. So you, it's not about personalizing. It's really about just those, I think she mentioned like hitting them with a feather kind of thing, like a nudge yeah. to make them think of you when they're thinking of that buying scenario. You know, I don't, I don't mean to go in down uh, a rabbit hole here. Or Let's do it though. Rant. Let's go in a rabbit hole. <laughs> Here's the thing about personalization, right? It's, it implies that I know everything about yeah. you to cater that message. Yeah. And I'm sorry. I don't know many organizations that, that have that much data that can actually truly personalize. Yeah. I see it more as I'm, I'm customizing a message based on a behavior or based on a signal that I've been Mm -hmm. able to create, which at the same time, I'm still zooming out Mm -hmm. because the content demands to actually customize or personalize. Mm -hmm. We couldn't, as marketers, we cannot meet that demand. Mm -hmm. There's no way. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, and honestly, and I'm not just talking about, oh, here's my first name in the subject line or my first name in like the email body. Give me a break. Like, okay. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about understanding my behaviors on your website, my behaviors coming up into the category, and then you're tailoring a message to me based on that. I haven't seen that. I haven't done that. There's no, there's no way. I mean, like within a data set, like if you really truly want to be personal, I'll give you an example. I'll try and make one up. Let's say I'm, Okay, let's say okay. I bought a watch lately. We were talking about. Yeah. I bought I bought yeah, a yeah. Garmin. So yeah. if Garmin was going to send a personalized message to me, they would have one uh, with showing me getting a knee surgery and then recovery and a f- and my bike collecting <laughs> dust and yeah. uh, you know that I should get out to the gym because uh, I'm putting on some weight. <laughs> like, yeah, you need to stay more hydrated. Like all those things, and it's also you like got your leg up at the office because you can't yeah. like. There's just no way that a company can know all that stuff. And oh, and by the way, here's the watch you were looking at. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, and we, here's the person. Or person, <laughs> here's you in this ad with all those things. Like it's just not possible. Exactly. Like, and it's totally no. unnecessary. No, I agree. I actually, you know, I'm I'm starting to, you know, I was on that train for quite some time. I know, like, me too. How do you, how do you get that personalized content? Yeah. I don't think it's about the personalized content anymore. No. I don't really think it is. I think you, as marketers, we have to be mindful of the audience that we're targeting yeah. with the message that we need to target. But trying to create that true one-to-one connection digitally, mm-hmm. especially with the changing landscape right now, yeah. I think it's going to become it's, it's becoming increasingly more difficult. Yeah. Nor should it be our priority. I think what we should be focusing on is how do we build those mind structures 
those yeah. mental that mental availability of yeah. the product or service that we represent and speak to the masses speak yeah. to the 80 not the 20 yeah the light versus the heavy you know well it, it kind of it's interesting that you say that too because it it makes me think like if if um you believe in market penetration you have to reach a lot of people if you believe in personalization you think you can win by just selecting very small segment of the audio of yeah. the market and and bob's your uncle yeah um i i think it's and we just went through this, this example my my wall watch is beeching, uh, beeping at me telling me to get up and move now but we just went through this example <laughs> where it's like okay it's impossible to get all that data but why bother i would rather like how much energy and effort are you going to spend trying to find all the things that make individuals individuals i would rather spend the time and money researching what makes a market the same like exactly. within the same because then that you can drive penetration you can drive market share not just a sale today because and show a good positive ROAS on an ad yeah no it's a great point i think it goes back to even what we were talking about with graham and and jorge we're talking about like just the mindful the mindfulness uh framework there where it was like being meaningful being salient mm -hmm. and being different right mm -hmm. so it's like spend the time research understand your audience use those three key pillars if you will on how you position that mm -hmm. don't solve for the personalization solve for the category Mm -hmm. Solve for your product, solve for your service. And I think that, that, and you know, the reality is personalization will continue to evolve mm -hmm. and maybe there's going to become more tools available to marketers that they can maybe get, get there. But the data sets required, you said this, they just don't exist right now to truly stitch together a personalized experience. Mm -hmm. And if we, even if we use your example as like your fitness watch, well, all the, the reasons why you're looking at a fitness watch are not part of this. The only thing websites are picking up is that you looked at a Garmin, you looked at mm -hmm. a Samsung, you looked at an Apple watch yeah. and you're being remarketed by those ads. Yeah. That is not personalization. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's not personalization. No, it's nothing to be sorry about. You're right. It's just retargeting. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just like nothing to do with personalization. Yeah. You talk to marketers though, and they're like, well, here's our here's how we personalize. And then we're we're retargeting with this ad because this is yeah, what they no. looked at. It's like, well, well, wait a second. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a good point. I I am um, I get excited about this. Like, there's so many good things that she and she said. And one of them also was around reducing risk. So we were just talking about what's kind of the makeup of a great ad. Well, right. And yeah. so, yeah, I think that was a really interesting point that she brought up too, because it's, it's less about like being a formula for the right ad and more about reducing risk. And I, I love that analogy because using the like, sort of, maybe the formula isn't the right word to say, but a, a checklist, let's say of, of proof points. Um, right. Like Vegas wins 51% of the time. Which is also to say they lose 49%, exactly. but they win 51 and they do pretty good. <laughs> so if you can At the winning. tilt your, the scales in your favor, I think that's amazing. Like, wh why wouldn't you take that advantage? I agree. I agree. I think you you also brought up that example, and I think she added to it when you talked about Nike, that I think you asked her, mm -hmm. like, how long did it take for Nike to separate Nike from the swoosh? Mm -hmm. And I think it was like after 20 years. But then she reminded us that sh they'll have to bring it back. Yeah. Because there's new entrants that are coming through. So while that worked for a period of time, that, pe that audience has already matured and maybe even moving out of it, mm -hmm. if you will. So how are you building that mental structure again mm -hmm. for that? I don't want the younger generation, but for those new entrants, right? Yeah. So it's like this constant game. And another brand that comes to my mind always when I think about that is like Levi's mm -hmm. as well. And they're like over a hundred year old brand. Mm -hmm. And yes, they've had their own issues and, and whatnot, but mm -hmm. there's something so iconic about the Levi's brand that is, you know, what is it that makes mm -hmm. it so appealing? Totally. Uh, well, yeah. And I know, People kind of throw out things like, you know, Apple is a, is a benchmark for like perfection in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, 
or or a company like Levi's or Coca Cola or any of those kinds yeah. of companies, and and you know, it's great. Um, but then, and they're great examples for a whole bunch of reasons. One of them is that I think you and I were working on this campaign together, but we did some work with Apple, and and like their oh, right. distinctive asset um, brand yeah. czar person, whoever, yeah. like it's very specific what you can do with their brand. Yeah. Um, and very restrictive because they are trying to protect it. And they're that regimented about it today, as I'm sure they were 20 years ago. And yet then we go on our own. We look at these big companies and go, oh, well, Apple does this and Steve Jobs does that. And, you know, like, uh, and then you go, well, but I'm going to do my own thing. <laughs> you know I mean? yeah. Like, I know I'm going to go against that. I, yeah. I'm not going to brand my video. <laughs> you know, I don't need to put my logo into the ad. <laughs> people, people know. <laughs> No, they don't. No, they don't. Why? They why don't. does Apple do it? The exact opposite, or Coke do the exact opposite, or Levi's do the exact opposite. It, it, it just staying disciplined, right? And yeah. and we talked about. Well, I think the question was framed around like building longevity into your brand, and if we're looking like the fifty to the hundred years, you're playing the long game there. Mm-hmm. Brands should outlive you and I, mm-hmm. right? We could be a steward of a brand at a point in time. But if we're doing our job correctly, it's going to be there after we're gone, after mm-hmm. we move on. And mm-hmm. I think when you think about it that way, as marketers, our jobs are literally carrying a torch for a specific point in time. And how mm-hmm. do we do that the best way possible for that brand to maintain that affinity? Mm-hmm. Or if maybe it's in the early stages, like whatever, how do I, mm-hmm. how does a marketer start that for that? Mm-hmm. But it's, there's a handoff that happens at some point. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you need that point, foundation. Man. That's a great point. Yeah. Cause then otherwise you get all these, every time somebody new steps into the role, there's a brand new approach. Let's and a rebrand. Brand new logo. Rebrand. <laughs> yeah. It's going to refresh. <laughs> rebrand. No, probably not. No, no, no. Yeah. no. It's easy things for us to say because we like, as marketers, we like new. Then yep. the bright, shiny thing gets exciting. You get people excited about it. Yeah. But when you're, th- and then again, if we're tying it back to business, real business, first of all, you have to understand what's the problem that we're trying to solve. Does relaunching the brand actually help you solve that problem? Mm-hmm. Or can we, I look and double click into different tactics or ideas that I can really help drive mm-hmm. business results instead of just a, a nomination and for an award. Totally. Right? Totally. Fascinating oh. conversation, V. This is great. It's awesome. Thanks, buddy. Man, this was great. Nicole, yeah. if you're listening. This was amazing. Thank you so much for your time with us. Yeah. This has just been so much fun. And like I I know you said this last time. I think we're starting to figure some stuff out. I think so. Like, like some I got four to pages of together. Notes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some pieces starting to fall together for me. So this is, this has been awesome. There's so many frameworks, so many laws, so many things. It just, I think you said it just, just a few moments ago is how do you go? How do you avoid mixing them up? (laughs) Because it's very easy to kind of cross wire. It's like, Oh, that's a meaningful difference model framework. And then here's the, yeah. The other one. I don't know. I guess, yeah, that's a good point too, because there are, I mean, we are talking about a lot of different models. And I think probably the thing for me that I would say is I, I, I need to spend more time understanding these things so that I can say it in plain English. Yeah, that's fair. And then it's less about the name of the model and more about what it's, what it is and what it does and and there's yeah. guidelines there's probably a lot of overlap between the models if if you spend a bit more time thinking about some of them i just haven't done all the work yet <laughs> so much to do so little I time know. my friend I know. All, all right, right v. this is awesome Thanks, buddy yeah man. good chat we'll talk to you again soon sounds good ciao